Lessons from Nearly Drowning on the Middle Fork of the Salmon River. Some of the most important lessons in life happen on the precipice of death. Now, I'm not the sort of person who seeks out those kinds of thrills, but I'm not always able to avoid them either. Last week, I almost drowned after I flipped a kayak while trying to navigate a deceptive set of rapids in the middle of a hundred mile rafting trip on the middle fork of the Salmon River in Idaho. It was a close call that could have gone very badly, but it also taught me a lesson about how to survive when the awe-inspiring power of nature grabs a hold of you and doesn't seem to want to let go. Before I get into the time that I spent tumbling underwater unsure of what would happen next, I need to back up a little bit to tell you how I got into that position in the first place. The Middle Fork of the Salmon River is a hundred mile stretch of tumbling and unpredictable water located in the very heart of Idaho's Frank Church Wilderness. About two months ago, I got a call from a friend of mine that a group of interesting people were going to head out on an expedition down the river. And he was wondering if I could come along and give some lectures about environmental training along the way. As a bonus, my wife, Laura Krantz, could get a spot on the expedition as well. I'd only just started really thinking about doing systematic lectures on what I wrote about in The Wedge and What Doesn't Kill Us, and this was a too good of an opportunity to pass up. I could give lectures on new material I've been working on and lead the group in breath work as well as meditation practices that I learned in Peru and India. The aim was to help people develop deep connections with nature. And of course, the Middle Fork was an absolutely ideal location for these sorts of practices. Every turn of the river reveals yet another breathtaking vista from thousand foot volcanic walls to dense forest to savanna like plains. It's a dark sky area with no towns at all for more than a hundred miles in any direction. And every night, a million pinprick stars light up the night sky. The entire journey would be a deep meditation on nature while also offering freedom from the constant electric bubble that we live in in the modern world. To tell you the truth, the river would do most of the work for me. As a lecturer, my job was easy. To top it off, the rest of the time, I would be able to enjoy my time on the river looking and using various rafts that the expedition company had provided. I was in ecstasy for three straight days and nights. Now, one thing you should know about me is that I grew up sailing and swimming in the currents of the Atlantic Ocean, and I feel extremely comfortable in the water. While I'm not an expert on rivers by any stretch, I was pretty confident paddling an inflatable kayak over six foot waves while the rest of the group was in larger rafts. In the first couple of days, a few people in kayaks went overboard in different sets of rapids, but no one had any trouble getting back to a boat. Some people were shaken, sure, but no one got hurt. While I was of course aware that injuries and even deaths happen on rivers like these, I wasn't thinking that such a problem would befall our own group, let alone myself. So when I saw other people taking unexpected swims, I sort of thought that it looked more like an adventure than a real dangerous event. I even mentioned that I thought it looked fun to one of the guides. And I think you might see where this is going. Suffice it to say, I was overconfident. I wasn't taking the power of a river that flows at more than 2,000 cubic feet per second seriously. After all, I hadn't had any trouble paddling through class two, three, and even four rapids so far, so what could go wrong? Then, on the fourth day, I was playing around in one particular bit of whitewater, nothing that looked very big, and hit the froth at the wrong angle. Okay, I'll be honest. I was trying to surf the rapid by shooting into it backwards and then paddling against the current, hoping to catch the eddy in a way that I could stay in place for a while and surf it. It isn't a very hard trick, but I was still learning. And then something, I'm not sure exactly what, went wrong. I was in the water before I knew what happened. At first, I didn't think this was a big deal. I was wearing a helmet and a life preserver, and there were two rafts behind me and a few more in the front. The initial dunk was quick and even refreshing. I came to the surface facing backwards with a good view of my kayak as it bounced along in the whitewater. 
For a few moments, at least, it looked like my kayak had pulled off the feet of surfing the eddy all on its own as it appeared to stay in place. My first thought was, oops, followed by, well, that was fun, as I assumed that the danger was pretty much over. I tried to get my bearings and figure out the best way to get back to safety, but I didn't have much time to think before I was sucked under the water again. Now, there is a particular type of water feature on rivers that guides all call a hole. A more technical word for it is a hydraulic. This is when the rush of water glides over an obstruction, usually a rock or a log, and then drops down quickly to a deeper level, sort of like a mini waterfall. The differential between the two levels causes the water on the surface to fall downwards faster than the ordinary flow of the river and then recirculate in a loop. You can think of a hydraulic as a sort of horizontal whirlpool. And this is the so-called drowning zone. I had no way of knowing it from my position in the kayak, but right behind the rapid I'd tried to surf was a massive hole hidden, at least from my perspective, pretty low on the water by the foam. About two seconds after I'd bobbed to the surface, I got pulled over a boulder and then down into the hole directly behind it. This was bad, and everyone who saw me go in knew it. My wife was in a boat in front of me, and the river was pushing them downstream at a steady four miles per hour. It was impossible for them to paddle backwards against the flow. She thought about jumping in to save me, but that would have ended up with two people needing rescuing, and that would have been much worse. Meanwhile, a guy named Eli Kretzman was in a boat behind me and saw me go over. Even before I was actually in the hole, he was already rowing towards shore, predicting that I would go in and pulling out a rescue rope from his belt. But he still had no way to get to me. For all intents and purposes, I was on my own. The green and white water churned all around me and I couldn't see a thing. Fortunately, I'd been able to get a breath of air before I went over the rock, and I wasn't particularly scared. I didn't know that I was in a hole. In fact, I didn't even know what a hole was. Instead, I imagined that I was just tumbling through a turbulent section of the river. I figured that I'd get spit out on the other side sooner or later. All I needed to do was hold on and then make a plan to get back to safety. I swam in the direction that I assumed was upwards, and after 15 or 20 seconds, peeked above the surface just long enough to get a breath. And then the water smashed me back down again. Luckily, I'm pretty good at holding my breath, and I kept reminding myself that I was probably just in some rough patch of water, tumbling between a few different rocks, and that it would be over soon enough but the water continued to hold me down for a long time. Maybe it was like another 20 seconds tumbling underwater before I somehow struggled up for another gasp of air. And then the washing machine dragged me back down again. Now on my third trip to the bottom of the river, I realized that something was seriously wrong. And while I wasn't conscious of the story at the moment, something in my mind, no doubt, went back to some advice that the big wave surfer Laird Hamilton told me when I was writing my book, What Doesn't Kill Us. Now, Laird is no stranger to accidents on the water and has been battered by the ocean in more ways than I have time to count. Back in 2015, I'd asked Laird how he survived all the times that he'd been tossed off his surfboard in the ocean, and he responded that oceans draw on forces of nature that no human can possibly overcome on their own. But they also don't hold grudges. The swirling currents are simply forces in their own dispassionate ebbs and flows. In the first moments of a crash, you are utterly at the mercy of physics. In that time of utter helplessness, the only thing that you can do is submit and relax. In the eye of a maelstrom, you must let nature run its course. It will either kill you as it tosses you against rocks or reefs, it will hold you under the water, or it will let you go. But at some point, he told me that nature has always offered him an opportunity where the forces led up just enough that he had a chance to do something. He said that you relax in the maelstrom in order to store up your energy so that 
If you make it long enough to see the opportunity, you can use every bit of power in your body for that one action that will hopefully bring you to safety. Now, this advice wasn't going through my mind word for word, of course, but it's a lesson that I've thought enough on that I can feel it in my bones. After my third breath, I knew I had to make some sort of move. Again, I wasn't scared. Instead, I had the thought that this isn't the end of my story. Now, those were the last thoughts that I had as it, I was crashed below the surface. But on this go around, I sensed that I was right next to something big. It was a, a massive, smooth boulder. And I can't tell you how I know this since I was effectively blind in the water, but I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the boulder was a greenish yellow with dark black specks. I felt its smoothness with my hands, and then, with all of the powers that my muscles could afford, I pushed off against the rock. Now, I'm under no illusion that the force of my muscles can resist the unstoppable flow of a river system, but I think that action provided just enough space between my body and the rock for water to fill in the gaps between us. A few seconds later, I was bobbing on the surface of the river with my eyes on one of the rescue rafts about 500 feet downstream. But getting out still wasn't going to be easy. I could see another set of whitewater rapids just behind the raft, and they were still floating downstream. There was a decent chance that I have to float over this other set of rapids, and I was pretty tired from the minute or so that I'd spent tumbling underwater. So I maneuvered myself into rescue position, which is uh, where you float with your back um, down and your feet on the surface, as I tried to get my bearings. That's when I saw the trip leader, Eli Kretzman, bounding across the boulders on the shore calling my name. I mean, he looks like this sort of blonde haired Adonis, and he had in his hand uh, this neon green rope cocked backwards, ready to launch in my direction. And the thoughts in my mind were that a rope would be really, really great. Uh, and I started swimming towards the shore, and I caught it on the first throw, and then he hauled me back to land. Now, even though I could have absolutely drowned, I was never scared at any point in this whole ordeal. My heart never raced, and I always sensed that I would ultimately be okay. Now, this could have been madness on my part. It might have been very different had I tumbled for another minute or two, but luckily it didn't have to progress that far. But I also know that everyone who was watching me was worried about my life. My wife had floated around the corner in the river and thought that I might have died. Every person on those rafts felt helpless that whole time, and I felt terrible for scaring them. My first words after burping up a bit of water was to ask someone to go tell Laura that I was okay. Luckily, I was. And there are a few takeaways that I think are important, and don't just make this story of a close call. The first, and most obvious, is that I was an absolute idiot for not respecting the power of the river. The rapid that pulled me under doesn't appear on any maps, and it's not particularly challenging or even notable, but even the most placid spots hold danger. And I should have been more aware of my surroundings and avoided this altogether. Another lesson that is very important is that I've done a lot of breath work and cold exposure, and that probably helped me keep that sense of panic at bay. If I'd lost control of my breath and gasped underwater, which would have been very easy to do, I would have almost definitely drowned. I would have also probably died if I hadn't realized that I was stuck in some way and then pushed against that rock. But more than my own brush with mortality, I can't help but notice an almost spiritual aspect to this whole ordeal. I believe that the river was listening to me. I'd asked for an adventure. Part of me thought that it would be fun to take a swim in the river. And maybe the river heard me and granted my request. After all, despite being stuck in that whirlpool, it was surprisingly gentle to me. Though I was stuck in this churning water, I came out with so much as a bruise. Sure, I had to hold my breath for longer than would be comfortable for most people, but when I'd had enough, the river kindly oriented me to exactly the right direction to face that yellow-green speckled rock. It offered me the opportunity to push off and free myself. In other words, maybe the river wanted to remind me about my own hubris before letting me continue along the way. And that's my story. 
I have to say, I am incredibly, incredibly grateful to Eli for tossing me that lifeline so I didn't have to go over another set of rapids, as well as the entire staff at Boundary Expeditions for putting together the perfect river trip. And most of the time, no one has an experience like I did, thankfully, because they're amazing guides. They cooked wonderful food, set up tents before we arrived at camp, and guided us safely through one rapid after another along the entire 100-mile stretch. If you are planning a rafting trip of your own, you couldn't do better than hiring Boundary Expeditions. I'm going to put a link down to their website down below in the doobly do. If you liked this video, please remember to like and subscribe. Also consider to signing up for my newsletter to get updates about adventures and insights. I put it out every week or so. You also might enjoy the stories I tell about climbing up Mount Kilimanjaro with Wim Hof while not wearing a shirt and the power that we all have inside us to change the way we react to environmental stress, a power that I call the wedge. And I've written at least two books about it. Thank you for all of your attention and support of this channel. It really, really means the world to me.